Hello class, welcome back. Today we're going to go ahead and get started on um, homework G, right? Module G, which contains section 4.5 and 4.6, all right? And pretty conceptual heavy, um, but uh, it's it's it just continues where we left off, right? So in, in the previous homework, we found out how to use the first derivative test, correct? Um, as a refresher, right? We said to find the critical point, right? To go ahead and find the critical point of a graph, all right? You take the derivative and equal it to zero. And this X value that you find here, all right? That is where you have a maximum or minima. We determine with the first derivative test that if you have, you know, that X value that you found out to be your critical point, um, you can plug in values to the left and to the right into the first derivative test, right? And, and it tells us things, right? It tells us um, if it's uh, a maximum, like I'm displaying here, right? Or if it's a, a minima, right? Um, so we're gonna go ahead and continue that idea, right? Um, and some, some definition, right? So some definition, um, whenever we're dealing with parabolic functions, right? So let's go ahead, right? We're talking about this parabolic function here, right? This is uh, this x squared, right? That is, right? Look how it's pointing up, right? It kind of resembles, right? And you want to do this U shape with your hand, right? Um, right, right? When it's concave, right? That's pointing up, right? It's curving up. Therefore, this is known as this is concave up, right? This is known as concave up, right? And of course, right? And of course, right? If you see that your graph looks like this, right? You want to flip your hand over, right? 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 That's supposed to be my thumb here, right? And this is going downward, right? This is known as this graph here is concave down. Right, and we're going to be identifying, right? We're going to go ahead and put a lot of things together here, right? We're going to put a lot of things together. So, right, we're going to be going over concavity, right? Whenever graphs start, let's see if it's mentioned here. Right? Oh, it is mentioned here, right? So let's go ahead and move forward, right? So now we're going to apply what's known as the second derivative test, right? So all that means is you're gonna take the first derivative, right? And you're gonna find that critical point, all right? We're gonna go ahead and find that critical point and you're gonna save it, right? You're gonna put it in your pocket, right? You're gonna save that critical point because you know it's a max or a min, right? It could be uh, either of those, right? It can be a max or a min. Um, so what you can do then, right? If you don't wanna do the first derivative test is you take the derivative again, all right? So you take the second derivative of your function and you're going to plug in the critical point that you found inside that second derivative, right? And just like before, you're only worried about the sign, right? If you find out that the second derivative at that critical point is greater than zero, right? If it's a positive value, then that's positive, that's up, that's good. That is, in other words, that critical point right there is concave up, right? So that's concave up, meaning this is going to be a minima. Ah, all right, right? So you find another critical point, you plug it in into your second derivative. Remember, critical points you find by solving for x in your first derivative, all right? So you get the critical point that you find in your first derivative, you plug it into your second derivative and you find out that your number is negative, right? So that means it's going to be concave down, right? Concave down looks like this, meaning that point, that critical point right there is a maxima. So, and, and so you can see the benefit of applying the second derivative test, right? You don't need to plug in points to the left or to the right. Um, you just have to take the derivative again, plug it in, and depending on the sign, right, it's going to be a maximum or minima, right? And of course, right, let's just say that you take the second derivative, um, right, and you plug in the critical point in there, and if, if it gives you exactly zero, that means it's inconclusive, it, right? We're going to have to more, more than likely try the go back and revert back to the first derivative test, right? Because that might be, right? It's just inconclusive. It might be a, a minima, it might be an extrema, or it might be what's known as an inflection point, all right? And we'll find out 
what an inflection point is, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and find out what an inflection point is, right? And real quick, right, let's go ahead and transition into that, right? I'm gonna go ahead and transition into inflection points, right? Inflection points appear, right? And I'll write, inflection points appear whenever you take the second derivative and you solve for that x value, all right? So in other words, whenever you get the first derivative and you equal it to zero and you solve for x, this gives you your critical point. But if you took the second derivative and you solve for that x value, all right? That value that's reproduced there, it's known as an inflection point. And what is an inflection point, right? What exactly is an inflection point? An inflection point is where the graph changes concavity, right? Where the graph changes concavity. So for example, right? So for example, you have a function that looks like this, right? Some, right, my maximum is here, my minima is here, and somewhere between those two points, let's just say right here, this would be known as my inflection point, right? This means that to the left of this inflection point, I am concave up, up into that point, and to the right of that inflection point, I am now concave down, all right? All right, and you, sure, you may have different examples. You may have something that looks like, like this, all right? Between a maxima and a minima, you will find an inflection point, all right? And let's do the inflection point as reds, all right? So there's gonna be one there. Between them two, there's one there. Between them two, there's one there. Between these two there, there's one there. Meaning, right? From here to here, that's concave up. From here to here, that's also concave up. Uh, I'm sorry, concave down, right? That's concave down. And from here to here, that's concave down. You know what? Let me keep these colors consistent, right? Concave down, right? We're gonna go ahead and label as purple. Concave down and concave down, right? And but between these two inflection points, this is concave up. Between these two, that's concave up, all right? So that's what the inflection point tells us, all right? Um, so let's go ahead and move forward, all right? Uh, something else I wanted to go ahead and cover as well, if, if, uh, right, was if this is your function, right? So, so, so one thing, right, so whenever we're deriving now, right, whenever we're deriving, all right, my x cube function looks something like this, all right? Meaning my x squared function would look something like this, meaning my x function would look something like this, all right? And what I'm doing from here to here is deriving, right? Uh, my constant would be a positive constant, right? In the, the positive x axis, something like that. So if you had a negative x cube function, all right? So it looks something like this. Negative x squared looks something like this. Negative x would look something like this. And negative constant, right, would be the negative y section, all right? Uh, one thing to also mention is if you have a function and if you find its critical point in the graph of its derivative, that's going to be a root, right? That's going to be a root. Meaning, if this is my f of, this is an x function, right? This is approximately like what? This is a negative x squared function, right? And I have a max here at x equals one. Meaning, if you were to derive this, right? This is going to have a root at that maximal, at that extrema, at that critical point, meaning at there, right? And from that chart I have that had displayed, I know that this is a downward slope graph, right? That is a downward slope graph, all right? So if I were to ask you, right, um, if I were to ask you, hey, look at this derivative graph that I drew, all right? Uh, let's just say A, B, and C, 
for A, for which values, uh, for over which interval of X values is the first derivative greater than zero, right? So in other words, you want to know where it is, a, where F prime is greater than zero. In other words, where the graph is above the Y axis, the above the X axis, right? Where it's, where, in other words, you're looking for where Y is greater than zero. This happens everywhere here, right? Remember, this is the graph for the first derivative. All right, all of this, my graph is greater than zero. So you would say this, uh, this is negative infinity to one, right? If you wanted to know, right, the next question asks over which interval of X values if is the first derivative less than zero? What's less than zero here, right? This below the X axis, all right? So that Y is less than zero between one and infinity. Right, between one and infinity. All right, and let's see what the next question asks. All right. Um, look at the original graph, right? Look at the original graph. All right. The question here is over the over the interval this function is over the interval negative infinity to infinity. This function is concave up, meaning the second derivative is greater than zero, or concave down, All right? The second derivative is less than zero, All right? Um, right, w w what do you think? All right, what do you think? Well, th there are many ways you can go ahead and look at this, right? Um, let me go ahead and clear this here. Um, if I know that this is a negative x squared function, right? And it looks like this, right? If I were to go ahead and take its derivative, right, it's going to be a negative x function, which we determined, right? It's a downward slope function. If we were to take this derivative again, right, this would be a negative constant, right, which would be somewhere down here. Right? Uh, for example, right, um, let's just say if this is negative x squared, right, derive that, this gives me negative 2x. Derive that, this gives me negative two, all right? Th th that's what I mean by that, right? Okay, I know that my second derivative is less than zero, right? It's negative. Another way you can also look at this, all right? Look at the, look at the concavity of this graph, right? It's going downward. So this is concave down, right? Meaning, my second derivative is less than zero, meaning I have a maximum, which I do, all right? Which I do, all right? So it all comes down to these concepts and, and understanding these ideas, all right? All right, and th all right, that's what I, what I was saying, all right? Um, my critical points are here and here, and between critical points, you have inflection points, which are right there. You find your inflection point by getting the second derivative and it equal like to zero. Okay. And of course, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and do a lot of these, right? I'm gonna go ahead and do a lot of these. Right, just by looking, right? Just by looking. I'm looking at this point here. Right. I'm looking at that point there. All right. Just by looking at this point, right? If I were to say take the tangent. Take the slope of this function, right? Take the slope of that graph, right? We, like before, okay, we said we're going to draw a tangent line like this, right? At that point, my slope is negative, right? Because it's going down, right? This is calculus, right? So this is just saying my first derivative is less than zero, okay? First derivative is less than zero, all right? Okay, very, very nice. Right, we can agree that I'd say my inflection point, it's somewhere there. 
All right, my flexion point is somewhere there, meaning this graph is concave up from here. And it's concave down from here. All right. Look at that point. Where does it reside in? It resides where, where it is concave down. And in terms of derivative, right, what's the definition? What's well, concave down is your second derivative is less than zero, right? Or well, your second derivative is less than zero, right? Oh, I found my answer, right? Where is it at? Right here. Right, so, so it goes back to these conceptual ideas, right? Um, and this is something you want to go ahead and write, um, right? Because repetition makes perfect, right? Uh, so if you want to go ahead and just constantly, constantly write these out on your, on your homework assignments, that's great, right? That's great. Right, so let's go ahead and put all of this together, right? Let's go ahead and put all of this together, right? Um, so I'm giving this function here. Um, and I'm told that they are perhaps, uh, there are three inflection points, right? There are three inflection points, right? So I'm just worried about my inflection points, all right? So let's go ahead and find them, all right? Um, so if my function is that, my first derivative is going to be, all right? This is going to be 60x to the fourth plus 120x to the third minus 480 x squared. I'm not done yet, right? I'm looking for inflection points. So that means I'm gonna take my derivative one more time, All right? It's going to be 240x cubed plus 360x squared minus 60x, All right? It's 960x, All right? Um, right, what, what, I'm gonna go ahead and focus on this now. I'm gonna go ahead and get this second derivative. And go ahead and equal this to zero, right? And at this point, it's just these. What have I learned in in um my uh, my algebra courses, right? Um, I can factor certain things out, right? First things off, they all end in zero, so I know I can divide all of them by zero, or I can factor out a ten from both of them, right? For all of them, all right? So this gives me twenty four x to the third plus thirty six x squared minus ninety six x and then divide everything by 10, meaning I just get 24x cubed plus 36x squared minus 96x to zero. And I also notice that I can factor out by 12x would be my greatest common factor, right? Meaning I have 2x plus, what's that? Three, oh, this is squared plus three x minus, what does that give me? 96 divided by 12, that gives me eight zero. Okay, and just like before, right, I want to go ahead and apply the zero product property. So I get 12x is equal to zero, and I get 2x squared plus 3x minus 8 is equal to zero, right? Um, so I know one of my critical points is at x equals zero, right? One of my critical points is at x equals zero, And let's go, how do I solve this next one? All right, how, how do I go ahead and solve that next one? All right, so you can do what's known as the shotgun method, right? Where you just test values out, right? Or you can use the quadratic formula, all right? Um, let's go ahead and do the quadratic formula, right? And I'll go ahead and solve that in just a bit, all right? And here we are. I went ahead and applied the quadratic formula and I find out that one of my x values ends up being approximately 1.39 and my other value ends up being approximately negative 2.89, right? So from left to right, all right. Uh, oh yeah, you can see here, right? Here up here, 
All right, from left to right, uh, D would be negative 2.89. The next value in the number line would be zero. And then finally by 1.39, right? So those are my inflection points, right? The, these values here are gonna go ahead and be my inflection points. So what we can go ahead and do is Okay, very nice. And here are my inflection points, right? Remember, these are not critical points. These are inflection points. Right, these are inflection points. And we said, right, you're going to see here that we can apply the same rules of the first derivative test, right? In other words, you, I, I really don't need to go ahead and find the critical points, right? Because just like the first derivative test, the second derivative test is just a test. I'm going to put, plug in a value between here and here. I'm going to plug it into the second derivative, right? Let me go ahead and focus on it, right? You may plug it into here, right? You may even plug it in to the one above it, right? I'll highlight those in yellow, right? You may even plug it into there, right? You may even plug it into this one, as long as it's the second derivative, right? As long as it's as long as the second derivative, right? You would go ahead and plug in um, any of these values, right, uh, to the left and to, to the uh, into that second derivative, right? So in other words, I'm going to choose x equals negative three. I'm going to choose x equals negative one. I'm going to use x equals one, and I'm going to go ahead and x use x equals two, and I'm going to plug in. I'm plug, going to plug it in into that second derivative, right? Uh, mainly, I'm going to plug it into that yellow one. I mean, I'm sorry, into the green one, right? You plug in negative three into that green one, and remember, I get I ended up here getting a negative thirty-six, all right? Um, you plug it into negative one, right? Right? Plug it into negative one. And I get 108. Right. I'm going to go ahead and plug that into positive 1. All right. I get uh, negative 36. And finally, I plug in 2 into there. Let's see what that gives me. This gives me 144. Right. So, in other words, here, this is concave down between here and here, right? Because it's a negative value. Between these are the two critical points. It's positive, so this is concave up, all right? So between these other values, this is negative, so this is concave down. And last but not least, to the right-hand side, you see between there and there, this is concave up. So in other words, uh, for concave up, it is concave up between negative 2.89 and zero and between 1.39 and infinity. That was a weird whistle, sorry. Uh, in concave down, uh, I am between, it's concave down between negative infinity and negative 2.89. And it's concave down between zero and 1.39. Right. So, right, that is the, in other words, this is the second derivative test, right? That here's the second derivative test. Not, you know, I'm not applying any, I'm not applying the critical points, and it's fine, right? Because um, I mainly focus on concavity, right? Let's go ahead and move on forward, right? Um, again, you would go ahead and do the, the, the same thing here, right? But here, let's see what, what, do, what do we need, right? Consider this given function, right? For this function, there are two important intervals between there, 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 and there, where it's a critical point. All right, so in other words, I'm going to go ahead and find my critical point, right? Let's go ahead and find my critical point. Uh, how do you find your critical point, right? 
you're going to go ahead and find your critical point by taking the first derivative and equaling it to zero, right? So this gives me two over three times five x minus two raised to the two over three minus three over three, all right? Um, let's see here. All right, times the derivative of the inside, right? Times the derivative of the inside, which is going to give me that, all right? So then, all right, derivative, all right? This here ends up giving me is that two or three? Yes, yeah, so this is to the negative one over three times one, correct? Right, and then rewriting this, I get, let's go ahead and bring that down. I get three raised to the x minus two to the one third, all right? So whenever I go ahead and, you know, whenever I went ahead and took the first derivative, look at my denominator, all right? right, right? We know that my denominator cannot equal zero, all right? We cannot divide by zero, all right? So that's that right there is going to be one of my critical numbers, right? One of my critical points. So at x equals two, right? I have a critical number, right? I have my critical point, right? Now, all right, we're going to go ahead and do the first derivative test. All right, we're going to go ahead and do the first derivative test to see what's it doing at that critical number, all right? Or what's it doing at that critical number? So this is two, all right? I'm going to plot per, let's go ahead and make this. Right. Make that red, meaning um, to the left, I'm going to choose um, x equals zero. That's a nice one. And then the right one, I'm going to use x equals three, right? And I'm going to go ahead and plug that in into the first derivative, um, to the first derivative, right? And I'm worried if it's going to be a positive number or a negative number, right? So I have f prime of zero is equal to 10 over three. Um, this is going to be zero minus two, right? Two one third, right? And if you remember, right from our, if you remember for our college algebra courses, right? Whenever we're taking an odd root of a negative number, right? So an odd root of a negative value, right? It, it ends up, it always, the, the negative always comes out, right? So in other words, what I have here is, Right, and you can go ahead and plug this in into your calculator, right? You, you, you know, you can let's go ahead and do that, right? So this is going to be 10 divided by parentheses, three parentheses, negative two, raised to the parentheses, one over three, close parentheses. Right, and you see this gives me approximately negative 2.65, right? So this means this graph is decreasing up to that point, right? And if you plug in, in three into the other value, right? You go ahead and find out it gives you a positive value, right? Go ahead and plug in three into there, right? That gives me 10 over three. So it goes up, right? It goes up. Uh, this doesn't necessarily guarantee that this is like this, right? That, that, there, that there's concavity going on, right? That there's concavity going on. Um, so I just know that it's decreasing at that point and it's increasing at the other point, right? So what? I, so in other words, I've answered this part here and this part right there, all right? Now I need to go ahead and determine concavity, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and take the second derivative, right? I'm gonna go ahead and take the second derivative, but I'm gonna wanna use this one here. Sure, you can use the bottom one and apply quotient rule, right? Um, but I, I prefer applying um, the, the chain rule, right? So my second derivative is over three times negative one over three uh, x 
plus minus two raised to the negative one over three minus three over three times the derivative of the inside, which is one, meaning second derivative is negative 10 over nine, x minus two raised to the, what does that give me? Negative four over three, All right? Um, let's go ahead and fix this up a little bit. This here ends up giving me the second, uh, to negative 10 over 9x minus 2 raised to the 4 over 3. And again, I cannot divide, right? I cannot go ahead and divide by a by by, by a zero, right? So what would make it a zero if my x is equal to 2, right? So in other words, one of my possible points of inflection, right? This could be an inflection, but we determined, right? It was a, uh, a critical point, right? is x is equal to two. Right? And just like before, right? I'm gonna go ahead and do the second derivative test, right? Let's go ahead and do the second derivative test. All right, and just like before, I'm probably going to go ahead and apply x equals zero and x equals three, right? x equals zero and x equals three into the second derivative, right? You apply zero into there, you find out this gives you a, Let's go ahead and see what it gives me. See there, let's see what that ends up giving me. Let's see here, did I multiply correctly? Let me go ahead and check this derivative real quick. Very nice, this is correct, right? So I end up finding out, right, whenever you go ahead and plug all of this in into our calculator, right, we get uh, negative 10 divided by nine times uh, negative two raised to the four over three, right? This here, this ends up giving me A, Let's do it by hand because my calculator doesn't want to behave. Negative 10 over 9 raised to the negative 2 raised to the 4 over 3. Right. Um, so it's up to you whether you want to go ahead and do the fourth power first or you want to go ahead and do the to the third power. All right. So I want to go ahead and do, in other words, I want to go ahead and do. That first, all right. I want to go ahead and do that first. You can do it the other way around, right? It's going to end up giving us the, the same answer, all right? All right. We'd find out that this ends up giving me negative ten over nine times sixteen. Of oh, this isn't to the third power. This is one over three. To be one over three. And clearly here, right? I see that this is going to be a negative value, all right? So in other words. Here it's concave down, right? Because it's a negative value. You go ahead and plug it in x equals three, right? Show your work, you'd find out that you also get a negative value here, all right? You also get, uh, it's also concave down there, right? So you might be saying, what does this even look like? Or what does this even look like? Let's go ahead and get that pulled up. Is this the correct one? Yes, all right. So this is my original function, all right? my critical point was right there, right? We knew I couldn't divide, right? This is why it kept giving me that I couldn't, um, that's why I was letting that root equal zero in my denominator, right? Because this is not smoothing continuous at that point, right? There's a sharp turn. And if you notice, right, to the left of that, it's concave down, right? And to the right of that, it's concave down as well, right? You can spread out, you, you can go as far as you can, right? And you'd see that it's concave down. So that's what that looks like. So very, very nice, very, very nice. All right, let's go ahead and continue. More conceptual ideas, all right? Con more concepts, all right? Um, you're giving this graph, right? And I want you to analyze this graph, right? Um, let's go ahead and use green. Whenever x equals four. So I'm looking at this point here, all right? I know that my regular function, 
at that x, all right? In other words, my y is negative. How do I know that? It's below the x-axis, right? So in other words, this looks something like, it's something like that, right? It's below the x-axis, all right? So I know my y is going to be below, it's less than zero, right? My y is less than zero, or in other words, it's negative. All right, let's go ahead and do the, the first derivative, right? The first derivative, right? We said we go ahead and draw that tangent line, right? And you notice it's curving down, right? Right, I want our mind to go, oh, this, this is negative x squared, meaning if you were to derive that, that it's a slope going in the negative direction, right? So in other words, my derivative at that point, right? is also less than zero, right? It's also negative, right? And if you, right, if we said, if you were to go ahead and derive this even further, right? You would go ahead and derive this, it would give you a negative constant, right? Right, but you can also see this, right? Another way you can go ahead and look at this in terms of concavity, right? Oh, right, that, that's pointing down, that's concave down, right? If it's concave down, then that means it's negative, meaning it's less than zero, meaning the second derivative is also less than zero, All right? So you, you, we've seen how everything uh, uh, comes back, right? It's full, full circle, All right? Um, I have the same thing here, right? I have the same thing here. I wanted to give a few different examples, right? Um, Right, they're giving me the x-axis, right? And I'm looking at this point here. Well, my y is below the x-axis, right? It's in the y equals negative values. So I know that at that point, whenever x equals one, this is going to be less than zero, right? Because, right, if this is your y, if it's positive, it would have been above the y-axis. And if it's negative, it's below the x-axis, all right? So for example, y equals two exists up there, right? Uh, that's something that's greater than zero, but something below here is like y equals negative three, right? So right, that's what I'm referring to. Um, so, okay, I go ahead and take the, the first derivative. That point, right? I'm gonna go ahead and use that tangent trick. Oh, very nice, All right? I go ahead and see here that this is also less than zero because it's going downward. But wow, right? Look at the concavity, right? It's going up. That's concave up, meaning your second derivative at that point must be greater than zero, right? Must be greater than zero. So very, very nice. All right, very, very nice. Let's go ahead and jump onto this next problem. Okay, right here, I want to go ahead and apply, right? Um, I'm going to go ahead and find the critical point, right? I'm going to go ahead and find the critical point, like I mentioned in the very beginning, right? I'm going to find the critical point and then apply it to my second derivative to see if it's going to be a maximal or a minima, all right? It's going to be a maximal or a minima. So in other words, I have this function, uh, g of x, right? So let me find g prime of x. prime of x, right? This is going to be full x squared minus, that one always gets me. Negative 36x plus 24. All right, uh, let's go ahead and find my critical points, right? Um, I know I can factor, right? I'm gonna equal this to zero and I'm gonna factor a 12 out of these, right? All right, um, 36 over two, yeah, okay, very nice. So then I know I can just focus on this part here. This is still my first derivative. Um, and this is just AC method, right? Meaning um, X minus one and X minus two, meaning at X minus one equals zero x minus two equals zero, all right? Meaning at x equals one, I have a maximal or a minima, and at x equals two, I have a maximal or minima, all right? 
maxima or minima, right? So these are my critical points, right? These are possible, possible extrema. Right? As we noticed on this section before, we can get uh, false, um, uh, what is it? Uh, what did it call it? Uh, a false critical point, right? Which is just an inflection point, right? So, right, for this question, I mainly focus on x equals two, right? I'm, I'm, only, I'm mainly focused on x equals two, meaning I want to know if at x equals two, is that a maximum or a minimum, right? And I'm gonna apply the second derivative test, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and get the second derivative. So which is, let's use that one up here, right? Let's go ahead and use that one up there. So this is 24 X minus 36 is equal to zero. I'm gonna equal this to, no, and there, right? That is my, my second derivative test, right? That is my second derivative. I'm not equaling it to zero because I'm not trying to find my inflection point, but if you were looking for your inflection point, that's what, how you would do it, right? All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and actually find it, right? Let's go ahead and do full circle here. Right? Let's go ahead and find this. Um, this is 24 X is equal to 36, meaning divide by 24, right? What does that give me, like 1.5? What am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 1.5, right? So that is my critical point. Right? Ah, oh, okay. This, this tells me a lot, right? It means that at 1, 1.52, 1, 1.52, all right? Uh, I know I have a extrema at x equals 1 and x equals 2 and a critical point at x equals 1.5. Um, at x equals two, I want to go ahead and determine if that is a maxima or, or a minimal, right? So let's go ahead and do the second derivative at x equals one, All right? This is gonna be 24, one minus 36, meaning this is a negative value. This is gonna be negative 12. Right, and then it, I'm not going to plot negative 12 anywhere, right? I'm not going to plot negative 12 anywhere. It's just telling me that I'm concave down, right, at x equals 1. Concave down, right, at x equals 1. I'm going to go ahead and then do the same thing, right? But I'm going to go ahead and apply x equals 2 into my second derivative, right? And you find out this gives me a positive number. So that means I must be concave up at that x value. All right, talking about at that x value. All right, if you wanted to know exactly where all of this is happening, right? Exactly where all of this is happening, right? So these are very important points, x equals one, x equals 1.5 and x equals two, right? To find the y values where all of these inflections and critical points are going on, you get those values, you get those critical points and inflection points and you plug them in, where do you think? into the original equation, right? Into the original function, because sorry about that. Um, because for every x value, you can always find its buddy, right? You can always find the y value that corresponds to it by plugging it into the original equation, right? So you find out that Let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. All right, let's go ahead and make this a little bit larger. All right. So now we have everything that we need to graph this. All right. Uh, one, 1. 1.5, two, three, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right. Whenever you plug in one into your original equation, I get 10. All right. So that means at 110, I have a point. All right, let's go ahead and plug in 1.5, right? Let's go ahead and plug in 1.5 into my original equation. You plug it into your original equation and I get nine. It's over here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and plug in two into the original equation.
it is gives me eight. All right. All right, and we know that at X equals, right, at the inflection point, right, that's where concavity changes, right? So um, to the left of that, to the left of 1.5, it's concave down, right? So my graph is going to do something like this. And to the right of that inflection point, all right, to the right of this inflection point, it is concave up. So it should look like something like that. It should look something like that, right? And if you want to go ahead and see what exactly does it look like, right? I won't ask you exactly what it looks like. I would, right? I would ask you, um, graph it, right? Graph it using um, uh, calculus, right? Uh, what you know about calculus using the first and second derivative test. Hey, right there, look, one ten. Right, my inflection point is one point five nine, and my minima is uh, two eight, right? You just graphed using uh, calculus. Right. Right. And for, for some like these, you would go ahead and do the same thing, right? You would go ahead and do the, the, the full test, right? So let's go ahead and do one more full test. All right. Um, you are giving this function has a local minimum and one local maximum. So let's find it. Let's let's do it all. Right. Let, let's go for it. Um, let's go ahead and find my first derivative. Right, this is going to be negative 6x squared plus, was that 54? Plus 54x minus 84. All right, uh, let's go ahead and equal this to zero and find those critical points, All right? Uh, let me see if, uh, I know 54 is divisible by six. Let me see if 84 is divisible by six. Hey, it is, right? So I'm gonna factor out a negative six. Right. I realize that I can apply AC method here, right? And this ends up being x minus seven and x minus two is equal to zero, meaning I have two critical points at x equals seven and x equals two. Okay, very, very nice. Well, I'm gonna want to just flex on the second derivative, right? Let's go ahead and find the second derivative of that function. Right, so I can just straight up find out is it a maximum or a minimum at those points, right? Um, so this would be negative 12x plus 54, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get my critical points, right? So um, in local, right? Well, we, we don't know what they are yet, right? So let's find out. Let's do this one. The second derivative, I'm going to plug in critical point uh, x equals 7. All right, negative 12 times 7 plus 54. Right, this gives me negative 30, right? Uh, but I'm gonna care about the actual value, I'm cared about the sign. So in other words, at F, at that critical point, this is less than zero, meaning this is concave down, right? I'm gonna go ahead and plug in now the, Second, uh, the other, the other value, right? I'm gonna go ahead and plug in two, right? And I get negative twelve times two plus fifty-four, right? And I can, we can easily see it's gonna be positive, right? Um, negative twelve times two plus fifty-four. This here gives me thirty, right? But this is positive, right? So in other words, the second derivative at that point is greater than zero, meaning this is concave. Right. Uh, so if this is concave up, me, it means that this is a minima. Right. It all relates to one another. Uh, right. Something like that. And for this one is a max. All right. Um, so the max happened at x equals seven. Right. So at x equals seven, I had a max. All right. I had a max. And for at x equals two, I had a min. All right. And a min, I had a, a two. If they're asking you for the value, right? So in other words, they're saying, hey, if x equals that, what does y equal? All right, what is its coordinate, right? What do you do? We say we plug it in right into the original equation, right? You're gonna go ahead and plug it into original equation to get the value, right? So f at seven, f at seven, right? You're gonna go ahead and plug in seven into the original equation. 
right? We're gonna plug it uh, seven into the original equation and you'd find out it gives me 59, right? You plug in two into the original equation, find out that value gives you negative 66, right? So this here would be 66, and this here would be 59, right? So, right, so you please show your work, right? But yeah, thank you, right? That is, oh, no, no, none of that. Thank you very much. Not yet, because we're officially done with 4.5, right? Um, I know this video is probably a little bit longer than usual. It's because I really want us to, to understand these concepts, right? Um, here's a fun part, right? So we're, we're done with graphing, right? Uh, 4.5 was mainly graphing, right? Using um, the second, the first and second derivative test. Um, we're going to now look at, well, now we're going to go back to taking limits, right? Uh, specifically infinite limits, right? As, as the variable approaches infinity or negative infinity, right? So, why did I write this? Oh, okay, this is not for this section. All right, um, right, as a refresher, right, if you had a function like this, you know that, we know that there's a horizontal asymptote here, and there's a vertical asymptote there, All right? You're gonna to want to use this as a guide if you want, but I, um, I do not. You cannot solve them using um, college algebra methods, right? Uh, you would have to show your work using calculus methods. Um, if your numerator, if the exponent of your numerator is less than the denominator, for example, if you had a function that looks like x minus three over x squared plus seven, horizontal asymptote. It's y equals zero. Remember that, okay? It's gonna help, it's gonna be very helpful. If your numerator is greater than your denominator, for example, you had x3 minus one over x plus 100, right? You have none. You have no horizontal asymptote. Right? And then you'd find out that if the exponent on your number on your leading term in the numerator, it's the same the value of the exponent in your leading term in your denominator. For example, if you had something like five x squared over two x squared plus one, your horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the leading coefficients, right? So it'll be five over two, all right? So, so remember these, right? Because it's going to become very handy. So you, you're going to be able to vis just visualize these limits, right? But you're going to have to show your work in calculus, right? But you should be able to just visualize them, right? So for example, right? So I wanted to go ahead and do a few examples, right? Uh, an introduction to infinite limits, right? So the first one, right, I am doing for A, right? I am doing the limits as x goes towards negative infinity of uh, six x to the sixth power. All right, six x to the sixth power. So, right, one thing I want us to know is just like before we were playing with the idea of zero, right, dividing by zero, uh, we're gonna do the same thing here, right? I need us to remember that if we're doing, if it's the, if we're doing something like infinity divided by a number, this is infinity, right? If we have a number, divided by infinity, this is zero, all right? If you have, let's just say a negative number, all right? Uh, let's just say you had negative infinity, uh, how about infinity divided by a negative number, all right? This is going to be negative infinity, all right? So the signs still carry out the same way, all right? The signs still carry out the same way, uh, right? And as a refresher, a negative number, raised to an even will always give me a positive number. A negative number raised to an odd, all right, will give me a negative number. And you can try it out, right? Uh, negative one to the fifth, all right? You can even do negative four to the fifth uh, CE, right? The square root of a positive number, right? This is gonna be positive, right? But we know that the square root of a negative number, 
this doesn't exist, all right? Uh, it's gonna give me complex values, right? It's gonna give me complex numbers, uh, which, which, which we're not gonna be dealing with, all right? Um, we know, what other ideas do we know, right? What other ideas do we know? Uh, we know that if you're taking an odd root of a negative value, right, just like we did earlier, this is going to be a negative number, all right? But whenever you're doing, right, the even root of a negative number, all right, again, this doesn't exist. Right? This doesn't exist. So with all these ideas, let's let's go in and find out what, what's happening, right? Oh, and just as an expansion of this, right? An odd root to a positive number would just be a positive number, all right? Um, so in examples for each of these, if you need examples, try the third root of negative one, find out the square root of negative four, and for this one, do the cube root of 27, right? You'd find out that this gives you negative one, this gives you uh, 2i, right? And this here gives you three. Oh. Right, um, this here gives you three, positive three, right? So now that I've covered those, those, those that the, the, the algebraic refresher, right? Let's do, let's go ahead and get started on A, right? So A, I'm trying to know the limit as X approaches negative infinity of six X to the sixth. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and plug um, negative infinity where I see it, right? So this is here is going to be six times, right? Let's focus on the sign first, right? Let's go focus on the sign first. Um, a negative, right, to raise to an even power, that's gonna be positive, right? An infinity raised to the sixth power, it's just gonna be a bigger infinity, but it's still an infinity, right? What's six times infinity? That's just going to be infinity, right? A little bit larger infinity, which is still just an infinity, right? So let's go ahead and do another one, right? Let's go ahead and do Go ahead and do C. We'll do all these odd ones. So you got the limit as x approaches negative infinity, uh, negative x to the eight, right? And you need to remember here whether the infinity, where the, ne the where the negative is at, it's very very important, right? Because this here is just negative times negative infinity raised to the eight, all right? Uh, negative infinity raised to a even power, that's positive, and infinity raised to the eighth power, that's just infinity, right? A negative a number times infinity, this is just going to be negative infinity, all right? Because a negative times a positive is a negative, all right? So re remember those going in, right? Remember those going in, all right? And let's go ahead and do one last one. We'll go ahead and do E. It's as X approaches negative infinity of four X to the ninth, right? So this is going to be four times negative infinity to the ninth power, all right? Um, a negative to an odd power, that's a negative. And infinity raised to the ninth power, that's just infinity. Right, four times infinity, that's just gonna be infinity, but this is a positive times a negative, so this is here is going to be negative, right? Make sure you go ahead and understand those. We're gonna go ahead and do some other ones, right? Specifically with roots. Let's go ahead and do the first three, right? Let's go ahead and do the first three. I have the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative four of an odd power to the x, all right? So this here is just going to be negative four odd power of negative infinity, all right? Hey, right, you can go ahead and split these up if you wanted to, right? So this is negative four 
All right, this is here is going to be negative 4 ninth root of negative 1 times ninth root of infinity. All right, go ahead and apply it that way if you want it to, right? Um, or you can just do it, you can do both methods in your head like I was doing previously, right? Uh, so this is negative four times, this is going to be negative one times, uh, this is just going to be infinity, all right? Uh, negative times a uh, negative is a positive, and infinity times or, or any positive value is just infinity, and right? If you wanted to do it the other method, right? Um, You'd say, uh, we know that the odd root of a negative number is still going to be negative, right? So this is going to be negative infinity, right? Because these, it's like saying the square root of an infinity, it's still a lower infinity, but it's still infinity, right? In a, in a negative times a negative equals a positive. So this is infinity, all right? And, and of course, right, if at, any, uh, if at any time you have any questions or concerns, just let me know, right? Let's go ahead and do C, all right? So I have the limit as X approaches negative infinity of six, eight root of X, all right? Um, so this here is six, Eight root of negative infinity, and right we already know right off the back, right? We cannot take the square the we cannot take the even root of a negative value, right? That's going to give me a complex number. In other words, it's it's this doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the real plane. Right? We're dealing with complex analysis, right? Um, which is an amazing class, by the way. Um, if you want to know what happens when you start uh, applying calculus to imaginary numbers, right? Remember imaginary numbers? Oh, it's, it's amazing, right? It's amazing. Just think about the integration and the, the, the deriving that, that comes out of it, right? But for this class, we're, we're not gonna be, um, we're not gonna be uh, tampering with that, right? But yeah, we're very, very nice here, right? So this here does not exist, right? So please remember the rules that I mentioned earlier, right? Please remember the rules that I mentioned earlier, um, right? And similar to here, right? We're gonna be taking these limits, right? We're gonna go ahead and um, continue taking these infinite limits, but right now with polynomials, right? So I'm applying these limits, but with polynomials, all right? And the idea of that some infinite infinities are bigger than others, right? We're gonna go ahead and see exactly that here, all right? So for A, right, let's go ahead and take that limit, right? As X approaches infinity. So this is 19 times uh, infinity squared minus 11 times infinity to the third power. All right. Uh, one thing that I write infinity squared, right? Infinity to the second power is pretty big, right? Times 19, still pretty big, right? But I want you to ask yourself, which one's bigger? Infinity squared or infinity to the third power? All right. Um, in other words, right, you can play with this idea, right? What's larger, two squared or two to the third power? All right, you can go ahead and play with that, all right? So we'd see here, right, that the this one is much bigger. So it's a little infinity minus a larger infinity, all right? Um, right, so, so here it, it's like equivalent, like you saying uh, two minus four, all right? What's the answer going to be? Negative infinity, right? Negative infinity. Let's go ahead and switch it up. Let's go ahead and do the same problem, but now with negative infinity, right? So I have 19 uh, negative infinity squared minus 11 negative infinity to the third power. All right, so this here is just gives me 19 times infinity, right? Um, Ha, ah, this is a negative value in there to the third power, meaning, right, another way you can really write this is negative one to the third times infinity to the third, right? And we know that any negative value to the odd power is negative, meaning technically what I have here is 19 times infinity plus 11 times infinity to the third, infinity to the third, that's just infinity, right? So 19 times infinity plus 11 times infinity. Uh, what's this going to be, right? Infinity plus infinity, right? This is just going to be infinity. A beautiful way of solving these, right? Beautiful way of solving these. Now, 
we're going to be dealing with rational equations right now. Now we're going to be dealing with rational equations. Things are going to be a little bit different here. And this is where this was supposed to be. You want to write this in terms of your leading term being in the very front, meaning this has to be limit as x approaches infinity of 6x plus 5 over negative 10x plus 8, All right? So in other words, I want to know what the graph is doing as x approaches to infinity. In other words, this is going to be approaching a horizontal asymptote, right? This is going to be approaching a horizontal asymptote. If you were to locate using college algebra, the asymptotes here, right? Um, you look at the exponents, we said, right? You look at the exponents and you see that they are the same. n equals d, right? Right, n equals d. Right, so you get the ratio of the coefficients, right? You get the ratio of the coefficients, meaning that my horizontal asymptote is negative six over 10, all right? And like I said, you may wanna use this as a guide whenever you're solving these, all right? You cannot just solve it using this method. You need to apply calculus, all right? So whenever you're doing this, you're gonna look at the largest exponent in your denominator and you're going to divide the bottom and the top by that variable all right so i see here x is the largest variable i have in my denominator so i'm going to do that to the top and to the bottom all right so this is going to be 6x over x plus 5 over x all over negative 10 x over x plus 8 over x all right uh, let's go ahead and simplify this here. Again, I'm breaking my own rules. That's not nice. Uh, the limit as x approaches infinity, right? Uh, let me go ahead and continue this further. Let's go ahead and simplify this. The limit as x approaches infinity. Uh, this cancels out with this, leaving me with 6 plus 5 over x all over negative 10 plus 8 over x. And I think some of you may already know what's going on. Right? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take my limit. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and apply infinity to wherever I have an x, I have 6 plus 5 over infinity over negative 10 plus 8 over infinity. Remember what I said? What is a number divided by an infinitely large number? This approach is what? Zero, right? So it's very important that, that, that we remember this, right? So this here is going to give me 5 plus 0. Whoa. 6 plus 0 over negative 10 plus zero, which is six over negative 10. Hey, look at that. They're the exact same, of course they are, right? And this is why I said, you may wanna use what you already know um, from, your, from your algebra courses, right? So you can at least, hey, I read it, you do that. Like, hey, I know my, my answer has to be that. If it's not, then I need to go ahead and check my work, right? And of course, simplifying this even more, right? Both of these are divisible by two. This is negative three over five, All right? So that is the limit, All right? That is the limit. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and right, do the same thing. Uh, we said the first thing I wanna go ahead and do is uh, write these out with the leading term in the front. It is there in my numerator but not my denominator, it's written in reverse. So I'm gonna go ahead and arrange these accordingly, all right? Because the what you need to watch out for is do not compare these two, all right? So that, that's how they get you, that's how I get you, all right? Kind of like, you know, these, be vigilant, all right? Uh, be on the lookout, all right? And so, hey, these two are the same, again. So I know this is gonna be a ratio of the coefficients, so, right, my limit as x approaches infinity has to be um, um, uh, negative seven over 10, right? Negative seven over 10. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and solve it how I solved it earlier, right? I'm gonna go ahead and solve it a different method, right? How you, right, there, are two, there are two different methods you can approach this. So I said, sure, it's the same thing, right? You get the, your focus is going to be the, 
right? You divide by the largest variable in your denominator, right? You can use the word divide or you can use the word factor, all right? So I know in my denominator, x to the third is the largest one. So a scale you may want to go ahead and pick up is factor the top and the bottom by x to the third, all right? So in other words, I'm gonna take an x to the third away from there, meaning I now have, right? And remember, whenever you're factoring, all you're really doing is dividing. That's all you're doing, you're borrowing, right? You're really borrowing, right? So in other words, this here is seven x to the third, but you are going to let me borrow three. This is minus two x squared, but you're gonna let me go ahead and borrow three. Uh, minus eight x, you're gonna go ahead and let me borrow three. And I chose three because that's the largest x exponent in my denominator. And I'm gonna go ahead and do the same thing to my denominator, all right? So in case you're wondering, why exactly are we dividing? Where, where, where is that coming from, right? What's well, coming from there, all right? You're, you're factoring, you're borrowing, all right? I'm gonna letting you borrow or negative seven x over x to the third plus 10 over x to the third, right? You simplify it. And what happens here? These cancel out, right? Leaving me with just the other step, right? And of course, there's a reason why I'm doing this, right? There's a reason why I'm explaining this method, right? And there's a there's a there's a reason why I'm explaining this method, right? Because it's going to be very beneficial to what's coming up, right? And again, right? You go ahead and take your limit, and this here ends up giving me. 7 minus 2 over infinity minus 8 over infinity squared minus negative 10 minus 7 over infinity plus 10 over infinity squared, right? And we know what infinity squared is, right? That's just infinity. So this is 7 minus 2 over infinity minus 8 over an even larger infinity uh, negative 10 minus seven over infinity plus 10 over infinity, another infinity, right? Uh, we know that those values end up going to zero, right? Two over infinity is zero, negative eight over infinity is zero. So the limit for this function would be seven, negative seven over 10. Very, very nice. And again, right, you use the, what you need, what you learn from college algebra to say, hey, oof, I'm on the right track, right? It, it works, right? I'm on the right track, it works. All right, we'll go ahead and do this one, right? Hmm. The exponent in the top is greater than the exponent in the bottom. So in other words, numerator greater, denominator less, right? Um, we said, ah, it's this one. There should be no horizontal asymptote. But what does that mean in calculus, all right? Well, what exactly does that mean, right? We're about to find out, right? Again, right? I'm going to look at my denominator. The greatest variable I have is an x, right? So I'm going to go ahead and factor an x from the bottom and from the top, all right? So limits as x approaches infinity, right? Uh, I'm going to factor an x from the top. So this is 7x squared over x minus 7x over x plus 10 over x. I'm just borrowing, right? Um, x. 7x over x plus 10 over x. And right, if you were to work backwards, right, if you were to go ahead and distribute this into there, right, you'd find out it cancels out with these x's, right, giving you exactly what I started with, right? So in case you, you were wondering. Um, so again, these cancel out. So I get the limits as x approaches infinity of 7x minus 7 plus 10 over x over 7 plus 10 over x, right? I'm going to go ahead and take my limit now. This is 7 times infinity minus 7 plus 10 over infinity over 7 plus 10 over infinity, right? 7 times infinity, this gives me infinity minus 7. Uh, plus what's 10 over infinity? That's zero. Over seven plus 10 over infinity, that is going to be zero, right? On my top, infinity minus seven, that's gonna do nothing. That's still infinity. In the bottom, I get seven plus zero, this is seven. And right, and we know that an infinity divided by a regular number is just infinity. 
all right? So that's what that means, all right? If your numerator is greater than your denominator, all right, it's no horizontal asymptote in terms of college algebra, right? But in terms of calculus, right, that means uh, it's, it goes towards infinity. All right. It goes towards infinity. All right. So there was a reason why I was saying why, or there was a reason why I was saying um, factoring, all right, factoring, uh, while we were factoring, all right. So one thing that I need us to go ahead and remember, all right, um, if your x for this problem is going towards infinity, you're going to want to factor out a positive x, right? And we're gonna, right, it's gonna make sense right now. All right, so let me go ahead and rewrite the top, right? We're gonna go ahead and do a limit as x approaches infinity is the square root of, hmm. Interesting, okay? Interesting. 11x plus four, a square root, right? A square root. All right, so what I want to go ahead and do is I'm going to focus on my denominator, right? I'm going to go ahead and focus on my denominator and see what I can factor out for my denominator, All right? Um, I can factor out an, an x, right? I'm going to go ahead and factor out an x. So I'm left with x, right? If you find out this 11 plus 4 over x, right? I'm borrowing one from it, All right? And on the top, how can you get an X up here? How can you get a regular X up there given that you're dealing with a square root? Well, you know that the square root of X squared will give me an X. So I'm gonna use that. So from the top, right, I'm gonna factor out an X squared. Right? And this is going to leave me with four plus three over x squared, all right? And you can go ahead and do the longer method, right? If you prefer the, that way and you find out that's what it gives me, all right? Um, so here, all right, the limit as x goes towards infinity, all right? This is the square root of x squared times the square root of four plus three over x squared, all over x times 11 plus four over x. Ah, look what happens here. That cancels out. Leaving me with the limit as x approaches infinity of x times 4 plus 3 over x squared all over x times 11 plus 4x. Success! That's what I wanted. I wanted just 1x at the top so I can cancel out with the bottom. That's why I factored that out. So leaving me with limit as x approaches infinity, all right, of the square root of four plus three over x squared over 11 plus four over x. All right, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and take the limit, right? Let's go ahead and take the limit. Uh, so this here is going to give me the square root of four plus three over infinity squared over 11 plus four over infinity. All right, this is just the square root of four plus zero over 11 plus zero. This is going to give me the square root of four is two over 11. That's your limit, All right? That's gonna go ahead and be your limit. All right, and just let me go ahead and clear this out. All right, I said, right, whenever your limit is going towards, towards, so towards, uh, positive infinity, you want to factor out an X, right? And the, the X that I was referring to was this one here. You want this little bad boy here, that one right there to be a positive X, all right? You want that to be a positive X, all right? Because if you were to plug in a positive into there and work it back inside, all right, it wouldn't give me a problem, all right? It wouldn't give me a problem. So that's what I'm gonna be applying here, but for this next one, right? I'm gonna be applying this idea here. So you just need to remember that if you're taking the limit as X approaches negative infinity, 
right? That value factored, make sure it's a negative X, right? This is very, very important, right? So in other words, I'm gonna go ahead and do the same steps I did earlier, right? Um, I have the limit as X approaches negative infinity of, let me factor it X from the bottom, right? And on the top, I'm gonna go ahead and factor an X squared. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and factor an X squared. So this should leave me with four plus three over X squared, right? Leaving me with negative X, right? Because why negative? Because if it's in order, in order for this to become positive, right? In order for this to become positive, right? If you were to plug it negative into there, this is a negative times a negative infinity, which is a positive infinity, right? It has to be a positive number or else you weren't allowed to take it out from the square root because you cannot take a square root of a negative number, right? So this here ends up giving me four plus three over X squared all over X times 11 plus four over X. These cancel out, leaving me with, ooh, I did it again, limit as X approaches infinity, right? Leaving me with limits as X approaches negative infinity, I'm sorry, of negative square root of four plus three over X squared over 11 plus four over X, right? And you would go ahead and take the limit and simplify this, right? You go ahead and find out it gives you the same value, but just negative, right? And in decimal form, right, uh, you see it's just the, the same value there. All right, so we said this here was uh, negative two over 11, all right? Negative two over 11. All right. Right, for, for these, we need to go ahead and, 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 and evaluate the limits, right? We need to go ahead and, and evaluate the, the limits that are given here, all right? So let me see what we have here. Okay, okay, I'll go ahead and do one of these, right? I'll go ahead and do one of these with you all. Um, it needed enter infinity or negative infinity, all right? So in other words, what this looks like here is the limit as X approaches infinity, all right? And you might be asking, how do I know this? Uh, because of the square root, all right? Remember, we're square roots. This is X squared minus three X plus one minus X. This is the same thing as all of this over one, right? And if you remember from the previous homework, right? This was what going towards test one, right? What was leading up to test one is the conjugate, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this by the conjugate, right? And I knew I had to do the conjugates because I'm dealing with square roots, all right? Plus X, I'm gonna go ahead and do square root minus three, right? Uh, on the top, just like before, I'm going to go ahead and do FOIL, all right? So I get the limits as X approaches infinity of squared minus three, one squared plus X times that, that's my outside, minus X times that, times the outside, which is this, right? Excuse me. All over square root of x squared minus three x plus one plus x. All right, so this entire thing cancels each other out. Not only that, but this squared cancels out with that square root, all right? leaving me with the limit as X approaches infinity of X squared minus three X plus one minus X squared all over uh, the X squared minus three X and writing uh, X plus one, plus one. All right, give me one second here. My pen isn't working. Okay, let's go ahead and simplify the top, right? My numerator, I get the limits as X approaches infinity. Uh, these X squares cancel out, so I'm left with a negative, all right? Uh, three X plus one 
all over uh, x squared minus 3x plus 1 plus x, right? Sorry, it's happening again. Very, very nice. Right, so what we have here is something very similar to what we saw earlier, right? My focus is going to be, right, uh, I need to factor out something at the bottom that's going to factor out this x at the top, right? Because if I were to go ahead and plug in the infinity limit, I'd still get infinity over infinity. That's not going to tell me anything, right? That's indeterminate. Um, so I know on the top, I can factor out a, right? if necessary, I can factor out an x, right? Which is going to give me negative 3 plus 1 over x. And at the top, at the bottom, I need to go ahead and do the same thing, right? So if I want to factor out an x from this entire thing, what do I have to factor from the inside of here? So I can have a positive x on the outside. And x squared, right? And x squared, meaning this is going to be the square root of x squared. I'm factoring that out. So I'm going to be left with 1 minus 3 over x plus 1 over x squared. All right. And we want to go ahead and do the other steps, right, where it's x squared. Uh, times x squared over what I'm borrowing minus 3x over what I'm borrowing plus 1 over what I'm borrowing. You can see that's what, what I'm getting, right? All right, so all of this plus x, all right? Um, this limit is going towards positive infinity, so this has to be positive when it comes out to the outside, right? It's going to be a positive x. So the limit as x approaches infinity of uh, x uh, negative 3 plus 1 over x over x square root of 1 minus 3 over x plus 1 over x squared plus x. Woo. Now I can go ahead and factor out a, a x from the denominator, right? I can factor it from there, and I'm going to be able to factor it from there as well. All right, so then this here is the limits as x approaches infinity of x over negative 3 plus 1 over x over x times the square root of 1 minus 3 over x plus 1 over x squared plus 1, right? These cancel out, leaving me with the limits as x approaches infinity of negative 3 plus 1 over x all over the square root of 1 minus 3 over x plus 1 over x squared plus 1. Woo, let's go ahead and take the limit. All right, this here is going to give me negative 3 plus 1 over infinity over the square root of 1 minus 3 over infinity plus 1 over infinity squared plus 1. Right, and if, and if you might have noticed now, right, a number over infinity is will give me the same answer as the number over infinity squared would give me the same number as right the number over infinity to the third power. Right, so it's just going to give me zero. All right, so in other words, this here is negative three plus zero over the square root of one minus zero plus zero plus one. This here is going to give me negative 3 all over the square root of 1 plus 1. All right, this here is going to go ahead and give me negative 3 over the square root of 1 is 1 plus 1, which is negative 3 over 2. That there's going to be your limit. All right. Woo! All right. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. So, right, uh, right, you're... I'm going to go ahead and do part B for you, right? The main thing to know with part B is since this is going towards negative infinity, you have to remember that whenever you factor something out, all right, um, what's going to happen? All right, well, what, what, what's going to happen there? So um, let's not make any assumptions, right? I'll go ahead and say that. Let's not go ahead and make any assumptions. So very, very nice, very, very nice. All right. Um, very, very nice. If you're wondering, this is going to, it's going to be three over two. Uh, no, it's not. All right, positive three over two. No, it's not. Um, you're going to have to show all your work. And I'll give you a hint. 
Um, it has to do with algebraic, simple alg uh, algebraic arithmetic in your denominator, right? Okay, right, now we're going to be dealing with exponentials, right? Limits as, right, X approaches infinity, right? So, so for these, right, it, it may seem kind of conf confusing, but, but it's, it's really not, all right? Um, here, you're asked to take the, uh, right? They, they here, they want to go ahead and know, they want you, the mathematician, all right, to, to find out well, what is exactly this, right? I'm gonna go ahead and show you the regular way, right? Um, the limit as x approaches infinity of e raised to the 5x minus x squared, all right? All right, uh, what, one thing I would do, right, is just um, take that limit, right? So this is going to be e is five times infinity minus a greater infinity because it's being squared, all right? And we agree, right, that the this here is gonna be larger than this here. Right, the squared has more of a power in the long run than just multiplying something by five, right? All right. So in other words, this here is going to be e to the negative infinity, right? But what did we what did we say about math, right? Do we want um, negative exponents? No, we don't, right? So furthermore, this is going to be right. What is x to the negative three to the negative two? This is just one over x squared, right? So this is going to be the same thing here, right? This here is going to be one over e to the infinity. And hey, e is just a number. It's a specific number, but it's still just a number, right? e to the infinity is going to be what? Right? It's going to be infinity. And what is one over infinity? All right. So what played a huge part here was this negative value, all right? And this is pretty much what they're 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 having you do step by step, right? Uh, they want you to take the limit of just the top part, right? Just just the top part. What does that give me? This here it gives me negative infinity, which we determined, right? Instead, so now that you're saying, hey, instead of I want you to write let t be five x minus x squared. How does that look like? This here just looks like e to the t as t approaches whatever this was, right? Negative infinity, all right? And what happened there, right? So you may even solve it this way. The limit as t approaches negative infinity of e to the t, right? If you were to do that, this is e to the negative infinity, which is one over e to the infinity, which is one over infinity, which is, yay, zero. Right, that, that, that's, that, that's we're still we're still using those, right? We're, we're still using those. Okay. So the these two questions are here because I want to go ahead and challenge you all. All right, this is this is why I have these here. All right, so all right, the smiley faces. All right, so I want to go ahead and apply. Right, everything that I know, right? I need to find the exact value, right? This is going to mean um, it's not going to, right? If you would go ahead and plug in the limit, right? You'd find out this is infinity or, um, zero over zero, right? Which is undeterminate, which means you have to go ahead and find a solution to this, so, right? So one thing I'm going to go ahead and want to do here first, right? Is let's try, hmm. I'm going to go ahead and multiply everything by t because I do not like these fractions here, right? I do not like these fractions. So the limit as t approaches infinity, I'm going to multiply the top by t and the bottom by t as well. All right. And if I do that, right, I, if I just right, if I multiply the top by t and the bottom by t, all right, I can go ahead and distribute that into there. This here is going to be t is 64 minus 1 over t minus 8t all over 1, right? Hey, what can you do here? What can you do there? How, how would this look like if you wanted to throw this t back in there, all right? All right, so in other words, the reverse process of what we were, we've been doing up here, all right? Right, when you had this x value, 
and you threw it back in there, right? It was the prefactoring, right? So that's what I'm going to do here. Meaning this here is just the limit as t approaches infinity of e squared 64 minus 1 over t minus 8t over 1, right? And simplifying the inside, I get the limit uh, as t approaches infinity of 64t squared minus e minus 8t all over 1. Hey, this looks familiar. We know what to do here. And I'm not going to solve this one for you, right? I'm going to stop here because I'll tell you. Remember this one? Did that is I just got it to this form for you. All right. So we know that moving forward, you would have to apply the conjugate. How do I know that? Because we're dealing with a square root, all right? Um, so meaning to continue, you would go ahead and multiply this by that. And please use the previous problem as a guide, all right? So very, very nice, all right? For 22, all right? Hmm. Wow, there's a lot of things going on here, right? There's a lot, a lot of things going on here. There's no square root, so I know there's not going to be any conjugate things going on, right? There's going to be any conjugate things going on, but hmm, let me go ahead and distribute this y into there first. All right. This here is going to give me the limit as y approaches infinity of y over 8 minus... y over 8 minus 1 over y, right? Just like the previous problem, don't want that fraction there, right? So I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by y, right? Meaning I'm going to get limit as y approaches infinity of y over 8 minus y squared over 8y minus 1, right? Okay. We're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere, right? Um, right. Again, if you were to go ahead and plug in your limit, right, you see it in be in be an indeterminate form. Uh, plus, I know I can get an exact value, right? I'm giving you a hint, right? Um, how do you combine fractions, right? How do you combine fractions, right? You find your LCD. You find out that my LCD is the this. So I'm going to multiply this by an 8, uh, this by an 8, and I'm going to multiply this one here by 8y minus 1 and 8, right? Right, because what, right, both of the denominators must look like that, right? So what is it missing, right? It's missing that. So in other words, the limit as y approaches infinity is y times 8y minus 1 over 8 times 8y minus 1 minus 8 times y squared over 8 times 8y minus 1, right? I now have a common de denominator, right? So this is just the limit as y approaches infinity of y times 8y minus 1 minus 8y squared all over um, 8 times 8y minus 1, all right? Um, let's go ahead and distribute to the top. The limit as y approaches infinity is 8y squared minus y minus 8y squared. Hmm. Over, let's go ahead and distribute the bottom two. This is going to give me 64y minus 8. Furthermore, the limit as y approaches infinity gives me negative y over 64y minus 8. I know that we're at the very end and we're like, man, like, I don't even know what to, I don't even know what to do here. Right. Like I am, what is going on? Right. Uh, you may want to get up, take a little break. And when you come back or even right now, right. You may see it now. Right. Hey, this is just how we started in the beginning. 
right? Numerators and denominators, exponents and variables, right? This is co uh, ratio of the coefficients here, right? So I know that my horizontal asymptote is going to be negative one over 64, but let's show it using calculus, right? All right, so um, I'm gonna divide, right? Let's do the other method, right? For those who prefer the me that method, I'm gonna divide the top and the bottom by the greatest variable of the exponent from the denominator, right? So I get a uh, limit as y approaches infinity of negative y over y over 64y over y minus eight over y, all right? This here is going to give me, whoa, the limits as y approaches infinity of negative one over 64 minus eight over y. Hey, let's take the limit. Right, so this is negative one over 64 minus eight over infinity. Right, so this is gonna be negative one over 64 minus zero, right? Therefore, this is negative one over 64. That is my limit, all right. All right, so these two, right, 21 and 22 from section 4.6, I hope those help. Right. And like I said, it, you just have to rewrite a, a few things. Right. But it's everything you've already seen. Right. And that is all I have for you all today. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.